Today I'll be reading from um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 through chapter 5, verse 1, um, if you'd like to read along. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us up also with Jesus, and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is God's word for God's people. Looking forward to a fun summer with Davis. He's starting off today, this week, uh, being our intern, and he's about to have a busy summer ahead of him, going off to lots of different camps with our youth and children, and uh, if anybody wants to take him to lunch this summer, he'd be more than glad to go get a free lunch somewhere. So just see him, get on his schedule. Kay just informed me the other day that her 30-year high school class reunion is going to happen this coming fall. And I looked at her, I was like, I didn't even know you were 30 years old. <laughs> I've only known her for 29 of those years, so you guessed it. We both graduated from different high schools in 1991. She graduated from Noonan High in Noonan, Georgia, and I graduated from Grissom High in Huntsville, Alabama. Now, as I was thinking about reunions coming up, I'm not sure if my class is having one or not yet, but I started thinking about, you know, the immediate things that that you'll think of as you um, go back to these reunions, and I started thinking of everybody that I'd like to see from from my class, Um, but of course, there'll be some things that have changed over the years. There might be a few more gray hairs or no hair. There might be a few more wrinkles along the way, maybe a few uh, more pounds or maybe a few less pounds in some instances, but... Uh, when you see folks you hadn't seen in a while, it's always neat to, to remember and reflect. But we always seem to, to look at those external traits uh, and external features. Paul says it's easy to lose heart when you, all that you see is the external things. We know that as things age, they often deteriorate. Whenever and wherever there's decay or corruption or wasting away, it's easy to lose heart. Paul knew about it as he faced trials, tribulations, physical limitations, problems of all kinds, the thorn in the flesh. In fact, it also almost sounds like he was on the brink of what you might say is more than he could bear. About to fall over the edge of the cliff, you might say. But his faith and his walk with God over the course of his life had also convinced him that even though he was facing all these difficult things, that God would not let him go. Amidst real hardships and sufferings, Paul expressed hope in God's work to redeem and to transform. He says it's easy to lose heart when all you're looking at are the things to do or the tasks to accomplish or the list left undone or the Uh, unknown expectations, the dates that have passed, or the times that might be upcoming. We can often feel as though we're wasting away because our vision can be so nearsighted on what's coming up. In fact, we're afraid to even take a minute to look around us, to take take a look from away from what we're doing, worried that we might lose our place in life. And there's no going back, we think. You know about all these things that are seen right in front of your nose, that what you're focused on is right there in front of you, and that's all you can seem to see. Many people today fear that the church is just continuing to lose ground, 
Fewer and fewer folks are regular attendees. More and more folks are claiming that bracket of no affiliation of any religion in America right now. Paul today might bemoan that the pandemic might have long-lasting effects on people of faith, on church attendance, on tithing. He might even worry about those conversations that begin with talking about the scheduling of youth and children's events because they look around and they realize more and more there are so many things taking our time and our energy. You name it. And it's pulling on us. He might recognize that even though the more active members, they're even finding other obligations and opportunities. He might get depressed because another longtime member of the church has passed away and the death has left a hole in the church leadership. He might wonder if all the surveys about steady, steady decline in attendance is going to affect the congregation that he's writing to and loves so much in Corinth and wondering if they'll see the same thing there. And he might be even wondering, is there going to be enough money to send back for the collection in Jer Jerusalem that he has a heart for, for the poor? He might wonder about the outer nature of so many of the beloved churches that are wasting away structures that have limited lifetime spans. And whether we like it or not, it's not now and most likely will never be like it used to be, we wonder. What is it in your life right now that might cause you to lose heart? Are the things going on around you that you just kind of want to throw up your hands and say, what in the world is going on? Are the things in our community that even seem depressing to you? Just the other day, Kay and I were getting out uh, all the things to put up in our yard by our pool, the canopy that we get out and that we can put food on and different things. And so we get the poles out, and sure enough, one of the poles is messed up. I had to go see Norman to help me get it back together. We get it, we get it figured out, rigged up, and then all of a sudden we get out uh, the, the actual fabric to go on the canopy and you know what happens. It was kind of old. Kay took it out of the box and it immediately ripped. <laughs> right before you're ready to get it on. Fortunately, we had bought a second one just in case that happened years ago. So it, was, it ended up being good. Paul, in our writing today, whose job we think was tent making reaches in and he grabs a tent metaphor for us today. And without really complaining, he writes, My outward tent is wasting away. The fabric is torn. The rain's getting in. The more vibrant color of the original tent fabric is long gone. It's faded away into some dull, gray, pale-looking thing now. I've lost half my tent pegs, and two of the supporting cord, uh, cord ropes have been frayed to almost nothing. And he's looking around and he's thinking to himself, one strong gust of wind and this whole tent may just collapse. Have you felt like that sometimes? Do you know that in your life? When you feel like if one big strong wind comes your way, it might just blow you down. And all things being equal, this sounds like the voice of, de of a defeated man. But I want you to note that defeat is, far, is a far cry from what Paul's tone is here, I think. Yes, it is at least as bad as Paul describes it. But yet, he's also able to dismiss what's going on around him as almost a momentary affliction in his life. No doubt it sounds terrible what's going on, but Paul keeps his chin up, you might say. Even though his earthly tent is in undeniable tatters, he claims that through Jesus Christ, he knows a larger truth. That there is a divine tent maker who is even now redesigning, refashioning something that can be beautiful. This earthly tent is not the end of the story, he seems to suggest. Not by a long shot. 
in spite of all the difficult things in life, Paul tells us, don't lose heart. Things, there are things unseen that have no lifespans attached to them. They are things that are eternal. There's this thing that Paul eloquently labels as a kind of weight of glory that has gotten itself deep inside of him through faith. And Paul doubtless knew that the Hebrew word for glory is kabod, which also means heavy, weighty. So he's basically saying that God's glory, it has power to it. By faith, a weight of glory exists inside each one of us. And while that doesn't mean that there won't be tattering of our earthly tents or that it's just no big deal, yes, it can be a big deal, but it does mean that it's not the final deal. Fixing our eyes on the things that are eternal of Christ helps us to not lose heart. Not ultimately, not finally, not as the last word. Paul knew what we needed to hear over and over is a gospel word that our doctors, our therapists, our home health care providers, that really they can't provide for us. Because the good news about it is that there is a weight of glory that cannot be dislodged from inside these sagging old tents of ours, you might say. It's kind of funny and ironic to me. Years after his death, the apocryphal book of the Acts of Paul would describe Paul like this. He was not much to look at, bald-headed, bow-legged, strongly built, a man small in size with meeting eyebrows with a rather large nose, the writing describes Paul. Not so glamorous, we might think. But the good news is that's not the whole story about who Paul was, was it? There was a master tent maker that had done something amazing and that man named Saul's life on the Damascus road that changed his life forever and made him Paul the apostle that went and shared the good news in amazing cities. Something quite extraordinary. You see, when our tent tears and sags, gets pushed around by the stormy winds, Paul says, there is another word yet to be spoken. We don't have to lose heart, not at the bedside of the hospice patient, not at the funeral, not at the graveside. We don't have to lose heart. Our troubles may not seem light or momentary when we're going through them, but in the face of eternity, it's just part of the picture, he says. There still will be something glorious ahead. And you can even experience it now, he describes. Because do you know those things in your life that have eternal value, that are really unseen but mean everything to you? Being aware of the unseen is remembering that behind the task, the list, the dates are reasons that make us be so focused. We're worried we might forget something important. The unseen might be the love that we have for our families and friends, the spirit that brings families back together. It's those things in life that bring you life. It might be even the, the memory of starting a new congregation and then coming back and being a part of that congregation years later. It might be realizing that though we stand still at this moment, God will open up a new door for us if we're willing to take the next step. The faith journey reminds us that we don't really know what's around the corner. We can't plan for it either, but we can be ready for it. It's through faith that we're ready for God to break in into these ordinary moments and do extraordinary and holy things in our lives. It might be that thing that you have to do that day, the laundry that has to be done, but it doesn't get done because something more important comes up, like a friend calling, saying that they need to talk. It might even be skipping lunch because a coworker comes to you and says they need some help around their house. You might be ready for the time when the long meeting turns into a time that you make a new friend 
all of a sudden you discover laughter, a meal, an invitation, joy. Paul says we're renewed from the inside out. And just as Jesus said last week that we have to be born again, Paul describes this kind of rebirth by what is taking place inside of us as our faith grows. So Paul says, don't lose heart. The world isn't going back to the way it ever was. Even when we go back to a 30-year reunion, we're not moving backwards. We're moving forward. Time moves on. God provides new things along the way. Paul knew that's what the Corinthians needed to hear. And maybe that's what you and I need to hear this morning as well. To be reminding, to be even reminded that appearances, they might be misleading because they're temporary. But the unseen, the unseen is eternal and lasts forever. Jesus doesn't give up on you and me, doesn't give up on this world. We realize that none of us have all the answers to life. But then again, neither did Paul when he wrote these words to the church at Corinth so long ago. He couldn't have possibly fathomed and known the way the gospel would take root in that congregation and in the other cities he went to and on and on even to you and me today. So I don't know what's going on with your life right now. But don't lose heart. The outward, it will fade away. But the inward, the unseen, it will last forever. Would you pray with me? Oh God, when we look at things on the out, outside, sometimes they're beautiful. But with age, we know that they often deteriorate. But, oh God, we're thankful that you don't just look on the outward things of life, but rather you look into our hearts. And you clean them, and you make us new each morning. So, oh God, we pray today that you would help us to not lose heart, but rather to continue to put our feet in front of each other, and to move forward in faith. We ask this, ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There may be someone here today that's never made that initial first step to following Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, and if God is nudging you to do that today, I invite you to come forward as our choir will sing the, the, the hymn of invitation. There might be folks that have been led here by the Holy Spirit uh, to become a part of this congregation to help us to move forward into being the people that God calls us to be. There may be specific prayer concerns you have on your heart and mind today. The altars are open, and I'd be glad to come and pray with you if you'd like. But however God's Spirit might be leading you to respond today, I invite you to do so as our choir uh, leads us in singing Greatest Thy Faithfulness. I invite you to stand as they sing.